představí. Moderate uh, our discussion with Timothy Snyder, who is uh, the American author historian. Uh, he wrote the book that we'll show you in a while. Boris Pashka, Farkas doesn't need any introduction. He'll read two excerpts from the book. We'll first show you the book. Can you show it, Boris? Uh, the name is uh, the, the initial English. Uh, title is Bloodlands. Uh, the Czechs translated it as uh, Bloody uh, Lands, uh, but uh, or Bloody Territories. I read the book in uh, the English original about two years ago when it appeared. It is one of the books uh, which, after reading them, give you the impression that uh, you have seen a new horizons, new uh, knowledge, and it is a very uh, impressive book, uh, and uh, you have the feeling that you must, it was inevitable for you to read it. Uh, Timothy Snyder uh, based his book on uh, um, writings that had already been published before, but he um, wrote a book which has no parallel. Uh, it was translated into 30 languages when it first appeared in America. It raised uh, a great uh, response. It deals with death, with victims uh, in the territory that we refer to as bloodlands. And between uh, 1933 and 1945, uh, 14 million people lost their lives uh, on this territory. These were not soldiers. These were young youngsters, uh, women, uh, old people. And uh, to date, nobody else has given such a synthetic view of what happened on this uh, territory. For the European history, this was uh, a crucial period. Timothy gives two new uh, and novel views of uh, the past. Firstly, the victims were victims of two systems, Stalinism and Hitlerism, Nazism. And uh, Timothy um, depicts the two systems uh, against the background of the deaths as the systems that uh, were complementary to one another, that were learning from one another. And at the same time, he opens a debate by comparing uh, Nazism and Stalinism or communism and uh, uh, asking the question which of the two was uh, worse. In Europe, such a debate, especially in the West, has never been launched. In the West, there was uh, an idea that, of course, Nazism was always uh, much worse than communism, but this discussion is still continuing. And, and the second concept that is um, questioned is uh, the uh, prevailing idea about the Holocaust. In the West, it was based on uh, testimonies known to the West, especially based on uh, Auschwitz, Auschwitz and the concentration camps in the West of Europe. But Eastern part, like uh, Treblinka, Sobibor, and others were pr virtually unknown. Timothy Snyder presented the story of the Holocaust in a completely different light, and we'll ask him to present it to us. We have agreed with Timothy that we'll speak also about the book, but we'll also speak about the wider response uh, uh, that was evoked by the book. But now I would like to ask Timothy, Timothy to present his book himself in uh, about five minutes. I suppose most of you have not read it, so that you know what it is about. I, I, I thought 
that before we discuss how the book is read and what it means for the world, we should uh, just have a very brief summary of what the book is about. As the author of the book, I take naturally a very conservative position, which is that the book is about what it's actually about. <laughs> and so I want to just give you, as, as Martin says, just in a few minutes, a sense of what the book tries to do, where it starts from, and where it finishes. So it starts from a very simple observation. It starts from the observation that in a relatively confined part of Europe, in a relatively small territory, 14 million human beings, children, women, and men, were deliberately killed over the period of 1933 to 1945. So this, to me, in and of itself, is an extraordinarily striking fact, and, and the sort of thing that requires, so to speak, a history. Prosim? Um, if, if, if you... If, Okay. If you, if, if, you've, if you observe that 14 million human beings have been killed in a relatively small period, uh, in, in a relatively definable place, you have a subject. You have a subject for a history book. A history book, however, that hadn't been written. The striking thing about the territory where all these people were killed, and again, Martin has already alluded to this, is that the place where these 14 million people were killed Either by, the Nazi, uh, either by the Nazi system or by the Stalinist system, is precisely the place where both systems were present. So it's, it's, it's a territory, you know, in today's terms, it's Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, the Baltics, Western Russia. It's a territory where the Germans were present and where Soviet power was present. And that overlap is a very important thing to notice because, of course, the Germans ruled lots of territory um, France, the Netherlands, let's say, uh, uh, Belgium, Germany itself, where Soviet power was not present. And the Soviets ruled a huge amount of territory, the vast majority of the Soviet Union, where the Germans never reached. The territory that we're talking about is the relatively small area where both systems were present. And on this area, the huge majority of people killed by the two regimes died. So in, if you look at the whole territory controlled by both regimes, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific, from France to Vladivostok, you have a total of about 17 million people killed. Of that 17 million, 14 million people were killed precisely in this small area. So again, it seems to me, there you have a historical question, there you have a problem that you have to try to explain. Another thing which is notable about this place is that this place that I'm talking about is also precisely where the Holocaust happened. It's here that essentially all Jews who were killed in the Holocaust perished. So to put it a different way, the geography of the Holocaust is the geography of European mass murder generally, which suggests that if we want to understand the Holocaust, we probably need to understand other policies of mass murder. And conversely, if we want to understand other policies of mass murder, we also have to try to understand the Holocaust. So the way that the book works is that it begins from geography, which is a very simple thing to do, but it allows me to avoid uh, the normal methodologies. What are the normal methodologies? Usually people write either about Nazi Germany or about the Soviet Union. I write about both because both were present on this territory. Usually people write about Jews or Poles or Ukrainians or Russians or Belarusians. That's a minority taste, admittedly. Um, but they, people usually choose one nation. I'm not writing about any one nation. I'm writing about everyone who is present on this territory. And usually people write either about one crime um, or another. I'm writing about every crime which took place on this territory. And this means that I overcome... Um, or I try to overcome some of the very traditional divisions that Martin's already alluded to. This book is not East European history. It happens in Eastern Europe, but the policies that transpire here are known from West European history as well. The Holocaust, for example. I'm trying to understand Nazi Germany, which is a classical West European problem, but I'm doing it in Eastern Europe. I'm also trying to bring together the history of the Holocaust and European history, suggesting that the two of them have to go together. So in beginning from territory, I'm, I'm able to, I hope, overcome some of these traditional divisions.
Now, overcoming the divisions is important because, um, for one thing, you can't see all of these crimes unless you do so. Who, for example, is going to be the witness to the mass starvation of three million Soviet prisoners of war? Well, the Jews are, for one thing. So the victims of one crime are very often the witnesses of another crime. Um, there's very often a kind of reciprocal relationship. And above all, how are you going to understand these crimes if you don't see them all together? Each of them has a relationship to all of the others. So the victims become the witnesses, as, and they also, become your, your, they also become the people who help you to analyze what has happened. So the final thing that I wanted to say about this book is that it's an attempt at, and you've probably already understood this, it's an attempt to, to write something which is not just the history of a regime, not just the history of a nation, um, not just the history of, of, of even of a place, although place is where I start. It's an attempt to write human history. I start from, the, I start from the, the assumption that the murder of 14 million people is a subject that we ought to attend to. And I close with the question of what it means that we were able to, that 14 million people, 14 million human beings were killed. Um, and it's, it's, it's my hope that in doing this, I'm not only able to present these crimes, some of which are known better, some of which are known worse. We know more about the Holocaust, perhaps. We know less about the, the killing of Belarusian partisans. We know more about Soviet terror, perhaps. We know less about the starvation of Soviet prisoners of war. In focusing on human beings, I try to give each crime its own weight. I pay attention to each crime insofar as, it, as, as, as people, as human beings were killed. But I'm also trying to stress that a methodological point is also a moral point. The methodology is we attend to, to, the, to human beings individually, and the moral point is that we're concerned about this history because individual human beings were killed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Boris. Takže teraz, teraz Boris prečíta z úvodu knihy uh, ukážku. Thank you. Okay, sorry, now Boris will read the Slo Slovak translation of the book. It will be not translated into English because we don't have the English ori original with us, so we are not going to ruin the masterpiece by trying to translate. Teraz už prežijeme. Hovoril si vyhľadnutý chlapec, kráčajúc obustenou hradskou krížom cez prázdne polia. Strava, ktorú videl, však bola len hrou jeho predstavivosti. Všetko obilie zhábali v bezcitnej vlne rekvirovania, ktorá odštartovala časy masového vraždenia v Európe. Písal sa rok 1933 a Josif Stalin sa pustil do cieleného vyhľadovania sovietskej Ukrajiny. Chlapec zomrel spolu s ďalšími tromi miliónmi. Stretneme sa, povedal mladý soviet svojej manželke, pod zemou. Mal pravdu. Zastrelili ho krátko po nej, oboch pochovali spolu so 700 tisíc obeťami Stalinovho veľkého teroru rokov 1937 až 1938. Vyžiadali si môj svadobný prsteň, ktorý poľský dôstojník nedokončil vetu v denníku. Onedlho na toho sovietská tajná služba roku 1940 popravila. Bol jedným z približne 200 tisíc polských občanov zastrelených sovietmi alebo Nemcami na začiatku druhej svetovej vojny, keď nacistické Nemecko spolu so sovietským zväzom obsadilo jeho krajinu. Pred rokom 1941 11-ročná Leningračanka uzavrela svoj denník lakonickým zápisom. Ostala len Taňa. Adolf Hitler zradil Stalina, jej rodné mesto obliehali Nemci a jej rodinní príslušníci sa pripojili k 4 miliónom sovietských občanov, ktorých Nemci vyhľadovali na smrť. Nasledujúce leto 12-ročné židovské dievča v Bielorusku napísalo posledný list docovi. Posielam ti posledné s Bohom pred smrťou. Strašne sa bojím, pretože malé deti hádžu do masových hrobov zažíva. Patrila k vyše 5 miliónov židov, ktorých Nemci poslali do plynových komôr alebo zastrelili. Uprostred Európy, 
Uprostred 20. storočia nacistický a sovietský režim zavraždil približne 14 miliónov ľudí. Priestor, kde všetky tieto obete zahynuli, krvavé územie, sa rozprestiera od stredného Polska po západné Rusko, cez Ukrajinu, Bielorusko a pobaltské štáty. V rokoch silňajúceho národného socializmu a stalinizmu spoločnej nemecko-sovietskej okupácie Polska a neskoršej nemecko-sovietskej vojny tento región postihlo v dejinách nevýdané masové násilie. Jeho obeťami sa stali predovšetkým Židia, Bielorusi, Ukrajinci, Poliaci, Rusi a obyvateľia pobalských republik, teda pôvodné obyvateľstvo regiónu. 14 miliónov ľudí zavraždili len za 12 rokov, medzi rokmi 1933 a 1945 za vlády Hitlera a Stalina. Hoci ich domovina sa v tomto období premenila na boisko, títo ľudia sa na pospol nestali obeťami vojny, ale vražednej politiky. Druhá svetová vojna bola najtragickejším konfliktom v dejinách a približne polovica vojakov, ktorá zahynula na jej bojskách na celom svete, prišla o život tu, práve v tomto regióne, na krvavom území. Avšak ani jeden zo 14 miliónov zavraždených nebol vojakom v aktívnej službe. Väčšinou šlo o ženy, deti a starých ľudí. Nik z nich v rukách nedržal zbraň. Mnohých z nich obrali o majetok, neostali im ani šaty na tele. OK, so Timothy, um, this book is, is uh, not only a book on history, it's just, uh, I also read it as a, as a literature, because you you wrote about a lot of and a lot of stories which basically most of them finished by death i mean that's a very personal question but i always say all the time when i was reading that i just had in my mind how could you deal with that just digging in the archives and following the death of 40 million people what did it what did it do with your with yourself Uh, Martin, I'm going to I'm going to answer that question differently than you've asked it. <laughs> uh, when you speak of this as as as, as literature, I, th I think you raise an extremely point, an extremely important point about the sources. Th this book only exists because of the first person sources, the sources from the people who themselves were killed shortly thereafter. In, in the paragraph at the very beginning of the book, which was just read, all of those sources are from people who died not long after saying or writing what they said or wrote. And one of the striking things about writing this book was that we have sources like that. We don't have many, but we have enough that we can actually try to recreate those individuals, that we can make those individuals into, into living human beings before they die. And for me, that's a kind of moral purpose of, of history, that the, the number 14 million is very large, but a number is always a number. Um, the number 14 million is, really means 14 million times one, where we're able to look at an individual over and over and over and over again. So uh, thanks to the existence of these sources, um, I was able to try to do something like that, to try to convey that what we have before us is a crime, not just because of the scale or not just because of the horrible ideas behind it, but because it affected these individual human beings whose lives we can see, if, if only for a moment. And the, the, the second thing which I wanted to say about literature is that if it weren't for literature, this book would also be impossible. There are extraordinary witnesses, most of them East Europeans, to these events. And I borrowed some of them. I, I borrowed Vasily Grossman. I, 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 I borrowed Gustav Herling-Rudzinski. I, I borrowed Hannah Arendt. Um, I, I, I borrowed Arthur Kessler. I, without I, George Orwell, without these people, it also would have been very difficult for me to bring all of these different themes together.
But as to your direct question of, of, of how this felt for me, I, I, I'm unable to answer that except to say that the, 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 the events that I was describing and the experiences that I was trying to convey are so much more significant than anything that I might have felt about them that I just, I feel, I would feel very awkward answering the question in that way. Um, well, um, this book was translated into 30 languages until now. And uh, it was translated and published also in the, in the countries where, where this had happened. Uh, can you, and, and of course there were, should have been probably, I, I suppose there had been a lot of debates about that book, about book, and, um, and can, you, can you describe some basic, you know, what was the reaction in Ukraine um, po or Poland or where, where other, in Belarus I think it wasn't translated, was it? No, not yet. Uh, but and and in Russia, uh, so can you just summarize a little bit how was the reaction in these countries about history like you described in that book? Well, what, what I would what I want to avoid is to say that the Poles said this, and the Czechs said this, and the Ukrainians said this, and the Russians said this, because in every country there was a debate. In every country there was a debate. More or less interesting, but in every country there was a debate. In Romania there was a debate. In Latvia there was a debate. In the United States there was a debate. Uh, th th there are a few general things that one can notice about these debates. One thing is that national history has its defenders everywhere. So the, one of the fundamental methodological moves that I'm making in this book is that I'm saying that national history is insufficient for understanding. I'm saying that national history is insufficient to understand even your own nation, right? So one of, one of the very smartest reviews in Poland um, by, by a rather conservative fellow who's, who's now Minister of the Interior. Um, a very smart review in Tegodnik Polszekny made this point. He, what he, he said, Snyder has shown us that even if all we want to do is understand the history of Poles, we can't just write the history of Poles. And I thought, aha, uh -huh, yes, that's, that's wise. That's one of the things that I was trying to show. So, but in terms of people's reaction, everywhere there, there, there's, a, there's a kind of national conception. Um, everywhere there are national academies of science. Everywhere there's the idea that one c we can understand ourselves. That everywhere there's, a, there's what I call the biographical fallacy. You know, people think that you can understand your own life by talking about your own life, which is wrong. The only way you can understand your own life is by asking your friends, right? It's, a, it's the same with history. You can't possibly understand Slovakia without looking around. You can't understand Latvia without looking around. You can't understand Jewish history without looking at the history of the Gentiles. So there's a kind of basic methodological move that I've made here. And I think that very simple thing has been the most painful and the most difficult for almost everyone. Because people prefer to think that whatever the truth of history is, we can contain it within our own nation, right? That's, that's what people would prefer to believe. And I think that's simply, that's simply not true. So I get basically, I'm trying to say something interesting now. I, 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 get, you, I get basically the same reaction from you know, right-wing Israelis as I do from right-wing Ukrainians, as I do from right-wing Poles, as I do from right-wing Latvians. It doesn't matter what nation you are in. What matters is how you conceive history to exist. If you think that history is a matter of an internal national conversation, you're not going to like this book. Whether you're Latvian or Jewish or Ukrainian or Russian, it doesn't matter. If you think that history, like life itself, is open to influences from all over the place, sometimes surprising ones, then there's a better chance that you're going to like this book. So um, I'm happy to answer about particular countries, but I just wanted to first make this generalization, which I think is interesting. Um, well, but then, then you also made a concept uh, about Holocaust, which, um, uh, which is quite new. Um, I mean, I, I have heard about that from you, actually, some couple of years ago, even before the book was written in Vilnius, you had this first... It was just shocking for me that, that our image of Holocaust, yeah, was, was mainly described by Western Europeans and, and, and those who survived. Um, and this image of Holocaust is Oswin which actually was not the camp for killing. It was more... more so, 
uh, first, I would like, to, if you can a little bit, very shortly describe this concept, this new one, and uh, what was the reaction in Western Europe in that? Because that broke a lot in the in, in historical view from Westerners, for Westerners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is an interesting, it's an interesting problem. Because if you start from the geography of the Holocaust, you realize certain very obvious things right away. You realize that the Holocaust was an event in East European history, that almost all of the victims were East European Jews. East European Jews were much more numerous. They were also much more likely to die. Jews from Western Europe or Southern Europe, insofar as they were killed, were sent to Eastern Europe first in order to be killed. So if you start from this geography, you notice this very elemental and very simple thing. Now, the question is, what do you do with that? And I, I tried to do three basic things. The first thing I tried to do was to describe the Holocaust as it actually happened, beginning with, with shooting in occupied Soviet territory, and then moving to, to gassing in occupied Poland, and then finally to the more familiar part, the attempt to ship Jews from Western and Southern Europe to Auschwitz, which was a very mixed success from the German point of view. If In just describing the Holocaust in this way, I think I contributed to something which many, many other historians and many, many other specialists have done before me, which is to try to to try to 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 to, to define to delineate um, what the Holocaust actually was, because as you say, and this is the second thing I tried to do. Up until now, the Holocaust has basically been understood in a rather minimal way, and it's, which is ironic because many West Europeans see the Holocaust as a kind of a height of criminality, as a kind of negative paradigm of modernity. And yet the version of the Holocaust that most people in the West have in their mind is radically understated. Um, it involves people from um, countries like the Netherlands or Germany where in fact there weren't very many Jews and where a relatively large number of them survives. It usually overlooks the Soviet Union and the Baltic states and Poland where there were many, many more Jews and where almost all the Jews who were trapped by German power were in fact killed. So there is a very fundamental uh, uh, revision that had to be made in Western Europe, which is that this history which many West Europeans thought they had, so to speak, mastered, has to be done completely again to embrace most of the victims. And this was uncomfortable in national terms because I think it's, I think it's the case that many German historians or French historians would like to think we have understood the Holocaust. But in fact, German Jews and French Jews are just a very, very tiny part of the history concerned. Um, French Jews, for example, in, in France, to make a very East European point, more Polish Jews were killed in France than French Jews in France, which is a sentence which French historians for some reason have a hard time writing. But once you understand it, you realize what the Holocaust actually was, that it was mainly an event involving Polish Jews, secondarily Soviet Jews, thirdly Hungarian Jews, an event which had to do with a certain kind of destructive German regime in Eastern Europe. But the third sort of revision has to do with Eastern Europe itself. Because, of course, the traditional West European idea of the Holocaust, in a way, is quite comfortable for Eastern Europe. If the Holocaust is about Anne Frank in, in, in the Netherlands, or if the Holocaust is about Victor Klemperer in Germany, or if the Holocaust is about Primo Le Levi in Italy, then East Europeans don't have to ask themselves how it happened, who was involved, and so on. And so when you push the Holocaust east, and when you, you notice that the vast majority of the victims were actually East Europeans, you're also forcing East European national history to open itself up to a subject um, which was thought in a way to be to the West, but in fact is really very much an East European subject. But you also said, I mean, that it's a, this, this um, what's talking also too, that, that the, uh, the Holocaust was a famous, um, definition of Sigmund Baumann as, as it was a, this, this um, cause and result of modernity. But, but you, you write about, about that most of the Jews, a majority of them, were killed by very primitive means, uh, by bullets or just by, um, I mean, old, not a, not a new modern uh, tools, but, but in a very old fashioned way, uh, which also, and very personal, so it, it breaks this, this idea of modernity as, as an abstract systematic machine where a human being doesn't exist actually, it's just a kind of a, it's a number. So I mean, also that was, a, it must have been a, it's a kind of a new concept 
of this past. So what do you think about if you, uh, did you talk about that with Zygmunt Bauman, by the way? <laughs> no, no, but I'm sure I will. You're, 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 you're right. I mean, I am, I'm quite consciously breaking with the whole tradition that starts with Hannah Arendt and, and the Frankfurt School and goes through, goes through Professor Baumann, which sees the Nazis as one example of, some, one example of something larger called modernity. I, I, I think that concept is fundamentally mistaken. And so you're right, here I'm in a completely different school. I think what was happening in Eastern Europe cannot be reduced to one modernity. I think, it, to make just a very simple point, the, the Nazi project was one of modernization the Soviet project was one of modernization. And even the Polish project in the middle was also one of modernization. But modernization is always in the plural. There's never, there's no one modernity which sucks in everything else and makes everything else just an instance. In fact, there are multiple and rival and competing ideas of modernization. And I think there's no way to understand what happens, for example, in Ukraine why more people are killed in Ukraine from 1933 to 1945 than anywhere else in the world. I think there's no reason, there's no way to understand that unless you realize that both the Soviet, pro both the Soviet project of modernization and the Nazi project of modernization, although very different, they both wanted to master that particular territory. Likewise, you can't understand why so many educated Poles were murdered between 1939 and 1945 by both the Nazis and the Soviets unless you see that the Nazis and the Soviets both thought that the Polish project of modernization had to be stopped. It had to be ended, and the way to end it was to murder the educated classes, which is exactly what happened. So you can't see what happened, I think, without a plurality of modernization. And, and again, um, this leads to another disagreement I have. It, these ideas of, of modernity it, it, it assume that what's happening is happening within one society. Whereas if you look at the geography of the murder, what you see is that the, the murder happens on the margins. It happens far away from the center. The, most of the murder doesn't happen in Moscow. Most of the murder doesn't happen in Berlin. It happens on the periphery, the western periphery of the Soviet Union, the eastern periphery of, of the German Empire, and above all, where the two regimes meet. And, 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 and interact. So uh, these are the basic ways in which I, I disagree with, you know, with the Hannah, I mean, with, I have huge respect for Hannah Arendt. I think about Hannah Arendt every day, literally. And I have tremendous respect for Professor Bauman as well. But these are ways in which I disagree with that paradigm. And I think that paradigm steers us in the wrong direction. And of course, you're absolutely right about the aesthetics of modernity. The idea that the Holocaust was a modern crime par excellence allows us to shield ourselves from its human possibility. It means that we see it in terms of metaphors like factories, right? And we memorialize it with big black slabs, things which are practically invisible. Whereas in fact, the Holocaust essentially involved human beings killing other human beings at very close range. It involved people shooting other people at about the same distance I am from the people in the first row. That was half the Holocaust. The other half of the Holocaust involved gassing, but there was nothing modern about the gassing. The gas chambers were just in, in, in most of the gas chambers were just automo automobile engines or tank engines where the exhaust was piped into a very primitive pile of bricks, essentially. It's something that anyone could build. There's nothing fantastically modern about it. It's actually rather, it's actually rather simple. And even there, for those things to work, human beings had to be very close to other human beings. So I think the idea of modernity shields us aesthetically and therefore morally from how this actually happened and, and distances up it from a way which I think can be unfortunate. Well, on the other hand, uh, um, Hannah Arendt, I think it's just, um, she, was, she was the first who came with this idea of uh, totalitarian, of, in her origin of totalitarianism, in a, where she put the, both system into one in one block, in one ideology, or not ideology, but, but one system. Um, and of course, I mean, from that, the debate constantly uh, goes on, in, especially in Western Europe, where for many reasons, Western Europe doesn't want to allow the, to, to make these systems similar, or even to put them in the equal, um, as an equal evil, uh, which has, of course, its roots. Um, but, but you, in that book, if you read it, uh, you don't you don't make actually any 
remark on that except one when you say that uh, Stalinism was worse in peace and Nazism was worse in, in war, basically when we put the number of victims. Uh, but still, I think that the, the, this question is intellectually provoking all the time for me. And I, can you then, I mean, say whether this book started a new round of debate about comparison between Stalinism and Nazism? And what's your, if I may to ask, you may not to, you probably will not answer, but still I would like to ask. Can we compare these systems in, on basis of evil? So, let, let me start with a very general observation about what, again, about what the book tries to do. A, a comparison starts from the assumption that two things are separate. So, I say, I'm here and, and you know, Leonidas Donskis is there and I'm not wearing a jacket and Leonidas is wearing a jacket and I'm not Lithuanian and Leonidas is Lithuanian. A comparison involves two things that are apart from each other. Um, a comparison is a kind of it's a kind of methodological activity where you separate two things and then you look for similarities or differences. The whole premise of my book is that you is that these systems at their most murderous were not actually separate. They were functioning in essentially the same time and in the same place. And in some time in some occasions they actually interacted. So I want to stress that my book is not a comparison in any kind of classical sense. Um, it starts from the observation that these place, these regimes actually can't be separated because they were always in each other's minds and they were always interacting, or they were often interacting with, with, the, with each other. The second thing I want to say about this is that I think it's obvious that, you know, so, so that said, my book is not a comparison. It's not, I don't, I don't start with the Nazis over here and the Soviets over here, as many articles do. I mean, there's a huge literature about a post-totalitarian literature which says that the NKVD was like this and, and you know, the SDA was like this, the Politburo was like this, and Hitler's ruling circle was like this. This is very profoundly not what I am doing. I am, I am putting the two regimes where they were historically in the same time in the same place. Now, that said, I think it's totally obvious that we can't have a taboo on comparison. I think it's ludicrous to have a taboo on comparison. To have a taboo on comparison requires somehow um, destroying, somehow obliviating the actual historical experience of the roughly 100 million human beings who were touched by both regimes, right? There are about 100 million Europeans who in some way or another were touched by both regimes. Are we supposed to pretend that they never existed? Are we supposed to imagine that they themselves forgot that they were touched by both regimes? Are we supposed to not read, for example, all of the Jewish Holocaust survival material which writes about the Soviets because much of it does? Um, if not most of it, are we supposed not to read, you know, Ukrainian Ukrainian memorial literature about the famine when it mentions the Holocaust, as sometimes it does? Are we supposed to go through the huge body of millions of sources and purge it of all these comparative elements? It's just a, it's a simple it's a simple basic historical fact that Europeans in a certain part of Europe were touched by both systems, and that this affected their lives. I mean, it's not just that they made the comparisons, which of course they did. They compared all the time. You know, people in 1939 in, in Warsaw who were trying to decide whether they were going to run away from the Wehrmacht or whether they were going to run away from the Red Army, they didn't think, you know, 75 years from now, there's going to be discussion about taboo, and so therefore I can't possibly compare the Red Army and the Wehrmacht. I should just sit here and die, right? They compared, obviously. They thought about which which one was worse for them, which one was worse for their family. They, they made their best guess. So comparison, or, you know, Ukrainians who were starving, and so, so Ukrainian Red Army soldiers who were starving in, 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 in German prisoner of war camps in 1941, very often they compared that to their experience in 1933 when they were being starved by the Soviet Union. They wrote songs about being starved by both regimes. They wrote poetry about being starved by both regimes. They wrote letters. Later on, they wrote um, they wrote essays about it. So this this is the the, the comparison is is part of the historical experience. And to say that we can't compare is to do huge violence to the actual historical experience. So I think the idea that it's a taboo is of course is 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 ludicrous. 
In the book, I do make certain kinds of comparisons. As you say, um, I, I note that for the Nazis, the revolution was really in the future. The revolution had to happen beyond Germany. Therefore, almost all of their murder is, doing, is, is during war and outside of their own boundaries. For the Soviets, the revolution was really in the past. Um, Stalinist violence was essentially about a kind of defense. So most of their killing was within their own boundaries and within peacetime. So I do make these various kinds of comparisons along the way. In terms of which one was more evil, I mean, that, that, that requires you know, a, 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 metaphysic, a metaphysical discussion, which you're right, I'm not going to go into. I mean, in the, in the book itself, my, as I said earlier, my unit of methodological and moral analysis is the individual human being. And just staying close to that, um, the, the Nazi regime killed about twice as many people as a matter of deliberate policy as, as the Stalinist regime did. I have to admit that uh, uh, when, I, when I have read this, this chapter about Ukraine famine, it was just, and the stories of people dying, uh, it was just something uh, almost sometimes I had to stop to read. It was so, it was, but I still do believe that this, I mean, we should, I mean, this book is fascinating by that, 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 that these stories and is the, the, the most terrible stories you can, you can ever imagine is written by a beautiful language, uh, which is a kind of a fascinating combination. And I think, I mean, no, no literature can be actually so brutal as, as the reality can. However, uh, I would now like to invite Boris again to, to read a part of that book, and we will continue uh, talking about what, what Boris will read. So now we will have a presentation from the book read in Slovak and therefore there will be no translation provided again. No. Test. Ke bi ljudja služili režimom iba na základe původné ideologické orientácie, existovalo by iba málo kolaborácie. Většina kolaborantů s Němcami na krvavom území získala vzdělanie v Sovětském zveze. V oblastiach na východ od línie Molotov Ribbentrop, kde národná nezávislosť musela ustúpiť najprv sovietskej a neskôr nemeckej moci, niektorí ľudia kolaborovali s Nemcami preto, lebo predtým kolaborovali so sovietským režimom. Keď sovietskú okupáciu vystriedala Nemecká, z ľudí pôsobiacich v sovietskej milícii sa stali policajti v nemeckých službách. Miestni obyvatelia, ktorí so sovietmi spolupracovali v rokoch 1939 až 1941, si uvedomili, že v ociach Nemcov sa môžu očistiť tak, že budú zabíjať Židov. Niektorí ukrajinskí nacionalistickí partizáni predtým slúžili Nemcom aj sovietom. V Bielorusku bolo často dielom náhody, či sa mladý muž pridal k sovietským partizánom alebo nemeckej polícii. Páchatelia holokaustu, ktorým vštepili ideológiu rasizmu, sa stali členmi sovietských partizánskych jednotiek. Ideológie zvádzajú aj tých, ktorí ich odmietajú. Ideológia, keď ju čas zbaví stranického kontextu jej politických a ekonomických súvislostí, sa stáva moralizujúcim nástrojom na vysvetlenie masového vraždenia ktorý pohodlne oddeluje tých, čo vysvetľujú, od tých, čo zabíjajú. Bolo by pohodlné hľadieť na zločincov ako na osoby, ktoré len presadzujú zvrátenú myšlienku a tým sa odlišujú od ostatných. Pri najmenšom na dnešnom západe je lákavejšie stotožnica s obeťami, ako pochopiť historický kontext, ktorý obete zdieľali s páchateľmi a nezúčastnenými pozorovateľmi na krvavom území. Stotožnenie sa s obeťami potvrdzuje radikálne vymedzenie sa voči páchateľom. Strážnik v Treblinke, púšťajúci zariadenie plynovej komory alebo dôstojník NKVD s prstom na spúšti, nie som ja, ale predstavuje osobu zabíjajúcu niekoho ako ja. Je však nejasné, či toto stotožnenie sa s obeťou prináša nejaké poznanie alebo či toto dištancovanie sa od vraha predstavuje morálne stanovisko. <kým> 
Vôbec nie je jasné, že redukovanie histórie na hry o morálke prispieje k tomu, aby sa ktokoľvek stal morálnejším. Nárokovací postavenie obete samo o sebe správne žiaľ neprináša správnu etickú voľbu. Stalin a Hitler počas svojej politickej kariéry stále tvrdili, že sú obete a presvedčili milióny ďalších, že aj oni patria medzi obete medzinárodného kapitalistického, respektíve židovského sprisáhania. Počas nemeckej invázie do Polska nemecký vojak uveril, že smrteľný úšklabok Poliaka je dôkazom o iracionálnej nenávisti Poliakov voči Nemcom. Počas hladomoru sa ukrajinský komunista ocitol medzi mŕtvými telami obetí, kopiacimi sa pred dverami jeho domu. Obe strany sa pokladali za obete. V 20. storočí sa nejaká veľká vojna alebo masové vraždenie nezačalo bez toho, aby agresori a páchatelia najprv netvrdili, že sú nevinné obete. V 21. storočí môžeme pozorovať druhú vlnu agresívnych vojen vychádzajúcich z tvrdenia o postavení obete. Politickí vodcovia nielen hovoria o svojich občanoch ako o obetiach, ale vyslovene sa odvolávajú na masové vraždenie v predchádzajúcom storočí. Ľudská schopnosť vnímať sa ako obeť je zjavne bezhraničná a tých, ktorí uveria, že sú obete, možno podnietiť k násilným činom obrovských rozmerov. Rakúsky policajt, strieľajúci do detí, si predstavil, čo by sovieti spravili s jeho deťmi. Obeťami boli ľudia. Skutočné stotožnenie sa s nimi by muselo zahrňať aj pochopenie ich životov, nie len sústrediť sa na ich smrť. Obete sú samozrejme mŕtve a nemajú možnosť brániť sa proti tomu, ako a na čo využívajú ich smrť. Je veľmi jednoduché posvetiť vlastné politické rozhodnutia alebo postoje smrťov obetí. Morálnu hrozbu napokon nikdy nepredstavuje to, že sa človek stane obeťou, ale to, že by sa mohol stať páchateľom alebo nezúčastneným divákom. Je lákavé tvrdiť, že konanie nacistického vraha nemožno nejakým spôsobom pochopiť. Výnimoční politici i intelektuáli, napríklad Eduard Beneš a Ilia Eremburg, tomu pokušeniu počas vojny podľahli. Československý prezident a sovietský židovský spisovateľ tým ospravedňovali pomstu na Nemcoch ako takých. Ľudia, ktorí o iných hovorili ako o podľuďoch, boli sami podľuďmi. Ak ľudskej bytosti odoprieme jej ľudskú prírodzenosť, stane sa morálnosť nemožnou. Ak podľahneme tomuto pokúšeniu a iných pokladáme za podľudí, spravíme krok smerom k nacistickému stanovisku, nie smerom od neho. Ak konanie iných ľudí pokladáme za nepochopiteľné, rezignujeme tak na úsilie pochopiť ho a vzdávame sa tým aj dejín. Well, um, uh, Timothy, you are now sitting in the in this room in the country where uh, Boris Tjakuem, um, where uh, is a little bit specific because we are we know about we are the victims. Slovaks are victims of both regimes. I mean, and also the creators of that. I mean, it's probably quite unique. Uh, situation like Slovakia where you had two origins of the system of nazism and and communism which were created by by our own people it means we had our own representation of of uh, uh, nazism and and communism uh, and we have this experience of how can you I mean then when Many fascists or Nazis changed into communists very easily uh, after 45, which is part of the Slovak narrative. Uh, every family had in, in its broader group some fascists and some, some communists for any case if the regime will change uh, uh, to, be, to be sure that you can survive. 
Uh, can you, uh, and on the other hand, Slovakia is not part of Bloodland. Um, can you, I mean, I don't know how to, I mean, I, my problem is that I have no question about it. I would like to, whether you can comment it somehow. I mean, um, isn't it weird, this country? No, no, it's, it's no, it's not weird. It's not. It's quite typical, actually. Uh, so let me. I'll try to let me work around your question, and I'll get to the point about how it's typical. Uh, th th what you say about each family having, you know, a, 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 a Nazi and, and, and a communist, you know, forever. It's it's like the medieval families, you know, where you'd have one priest and you have one soldier. So you're prepared for everything. Th this is actually a deep sociological truth. It's one of these things that you only notice if you look at territory and human beings rather than at ideology. If you take ideology too seriously, you think the people who joined the communist parties after the Second World War must have been believing communists. And some of them were. Some of them were, but the vast majority were not. Um, and if you take, you know, if you take fascism seriously, you think, well, the people who were involved in fascist organizations um, or in right-wing national states, they, they could never have joined communist regimes. But many of them, in fact, did. In fact, one of the one of the findings in in, in recent Polish historiography, which I find quite striking, um, is that it, it seems to turn out that Poles who killed Jews during the war were much more likely to join the Communist Party after the war. Which, if you think about it, makes sense. Not because they were just generically evil, but because when you do things like that, it's very important to then be able to cover your tracks afterwards. And, you know, as Jan Gross pointed out long ago, once you co collaborate with one regime, the only way, you're in a way bound to collaborate with the next regime because it's the only way to, to, to save yourself. So there is this sociological truth. I mean, in, in the passage that was read, I, I, I wrote about double collaboration. Double collaboration was massive, and of course, neither regime could have survived without it. If you just think about the police forces, it just wasn't the case that when the Germans came in, they fired all the Soviet police officers and hired new ones. They just they didn't do that. They took the young men who were there and they made them into their own police force. And when the Soviets came back, they did the same thing again. They didn't have any choice. It's when you come into a village, there are only so many young men. You can't just do away with all of them. And the same is true for local administration. It's true all the way up to the very top where both regimes did try to change with, with, with limited success. I mean, another thing that we're learning is a lot of the important perpetrators of the Holocaust in the Baltic states in particular, and Estonia is a specialist in this, um, were, were, were often NKVD officers or agents right before that, I mean, immediately before that, sometimes days before that, <laughs> they'd been working for the NKVD. So there's this deep sociological truth here. Now, does does that mean that does that mean that the regimes are are um, does that mean that the regimes are the same? No, it doesn't mean that the regimes are the same. They had different organizational structures. They had different aims. But human beings are human beings everywhere. And so, if you're writing a history of human beings, then these things seem less less surprising. So, Slovakia. It's true that Slovakia is not part of the bloodlands because I, I define the bloodlands as being the places where um, Nazi power, not just some fascist regime or a far right regime, but the Nazi Nazi power was actually present. So I'm not including Hungary and Romania and Slovakia and, and Croatia and Vichy France. I'm, I'm talking about places where the Nazis actually destroyed the previous state and installed their own apparatus, and where in turn the Soviets then returned the favor and installed their own apparatus later on. So Slovakia and Hungary and Romania are not part of the bloodlands, but they are part of a kindred phenomenon. Um, Slovakia, Romania, Hungary, Italy, France, these are all states which collaborated um, with Nazi Germany, which took part in the war effort to a greater or to a lesser extent. Um, and then which, which, which after the war then had two different fates. France and Italy um, become part of Western Europe, whereas Slovakia, um, Croatia, Hungary, Romania remain, in part of, remain part of Eastern Europe. And so then you have this double nationalism, communism thing that we were talking about before. France and Italy get to have the much nicer fate of joining Western Europe, which interestingly enough means that you get to forget about 
your own past. I mean, this is true of West Germany as well. What I find interesting about the present moment is that one sign of European unification is that debates about French memory and debates about Slovak memory or debates about Italian memory are becoming very similar once again. The problems that Slovaks have are actually the same problems that the French have. Once you, once you dig through the communist period and, and you're debating about decisions made in 1942 and 1943, all of a sudden Slovakia and France look rather similar and all of a sudden you know, the, 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 comp the division between East and West starts to fall away and you're dealing with the problem of European history and the problem, that problem is is how did sovereign states behave when they were allies or under the influence of Nazi Germany? Here, Slovak historians and Slovaks actually have lots of company. You know, there are plenty of uh, there are plenty of Italians and French people and Romanians and Croats who are devoting these, these who are discussing these same issues. So, no, I, I, in the end, I don't think Slovakia is that strange at all. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I'm relieved, but um, still, um, is there any? Um, do you follow these these debates in these countries? I mean, is it any are are some countries who are better in their uh, digging up the memory, uh, and the others are less um, active in that? Can you can you see it? Hmm. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I, I read a lot of these languages, but not all of them. And the, the debates that I follow is, are partly a matter of where I happen to be at a certain time. Um, I'll just make two remarks. The first is that I think the, Pol the Polish debate remains ahead of everyone else's. That the, the Polish debate, which was essentially begun by Jan Gross um, more than a decade ago now, is ahead of everyone else's in the sense that there are just more books and those books are more critical and those debates are more widely known. So I think that's actually kind of a case in and of itself. And interestingly, and again to repeat this point, you could say that there are more interesting books in Poland um, currently than there are in France. So it's no longer a kind of East European memory derby. I think we're now in Derby was probably not a good word to choose, but we're, we're, it's not it's not an East European memory contest. We're now in a kind of European memory world where you can ask, okay, how are the French historians doing as opposed to how the Polish historians are doing? Um, you know, R Romania has been very late to, to come to terms with these things, which is striking because of the, the scale of the crimes committed in Romania during the Second World War. But even there, in the last two years, there have been there have been several books. So, no, it's, it's very hard for me to say that this, what I would say though is that on the one hand, you want these debates to happen as soon as possible. On the other hand, one has to remember that even in France, um, these things took essentially 50 years to, to, to be taken seriously. And by that standard, East European debates, although disappointing all the time, um, nevertheless leave some room for hope that things will eventually get better. Uh, if there is anyone from the audience, maybe you would like to ask, but it's too dark for me to see. So, uh, but if you show, raise your hand, I can send you a mic. So, could anyone help me? But before that, I will ask a question, but I would really appreciate the discussion. Thank um, And you... And you discuss that also in a, this, another wonderful book with Timothy Snyder, uh, made an interview with, with Tony Judd, and now it's published in Czech. It's a beautiful book, but it's also about history. Um, but it also mentioned there um, the responsibility, when you talk with Tony Judd, about British and American uh, politicians who knew in '41 already that the Holocaust, or, I mean, they, they knew about the Holocaust already, and they didn't do anything to stop, I mean, they didn't do anything just to stop it, although they knew. Uh, so, is, uh, so the responsibility is not only here, but it's also actually in the whole world. Is it so? I mean, do they, and do Americans actually talk about that? So, I mean, you, you raise a really important comparative point. It's very easy for an American to, to, to look at a poll and say, well, there was a lot of anti-Semitism in your country. How could, how could you have allowed the Holocaust to happen? But there was also a lot of anti-Semitism in the United States. And our, our own 
our own view of the Second World War, I think, competes with the Russian view as being among the least reflective, um, among the least self-critical. Uh, the anti-Semitism is a really good example because anti-Semitism is a problem that every government fighting the Second World War had. The problem was that Hitler's propaganda very consistently said, this is a Jewish war. So if you were fighting against Nazi Germany, you were fighting for the Jews. And that propaganda was very effective in Britain, in the United States, in the Soviet Union. So this is a common problem. Anti-Semitism was a global issue at the time, as Hitler understood quite well. Um, Americans, in general, have completely blocked that out. Um, we now have convinced ourselves that we were fighting the Second World War to save the Jews, which is, which is nonsense. Um, in fact, our president had the problem of dealing with widespread anti-Semitism and widespread isolationism, and it took a lot of effort to actually get the United States into the war in the first place. And once we were in the war, it was very important for him um, to make very clear that the war had nothing to do with the Jews. So um, it's, I, I think you're, you're, you're fundamentally right that, I mean, there's this question of responsibility, which is partly a matter of recognizing um, what your own moral position was at the time, and then also partly a matter of recognizing what you can do. Now, the question of whether the Americans could have stopped the Holocaust is a, is a practical question. I mean, I, I tend to think there was relatively little that could have been done in the time and in the place. But that's a, that's a different question. I mean, the, one of the, for me, one of the reasons why it would have been hard to do much is that American society was much more anti-Semitic than Americans are willing to recognize now. Thank you very much. So I am that man with the jacket whom Tim mentioned. So no need to ask. Tim, uh, thank you very much. Just a very brief remark and a question concerning uh, the duality of perpetrators and victims, which was very widespread in Ukraine, Lithuania, the Baltic states, and this common feeling that people acted out of despair at the same time, thinking that they were victims, although some of them chose to close the ranks with the Nazis and to, to, to kill the fellow citizens. But at the same time, what is really striking is the velocity, the speed. In Lithuania, for instance, the very fact that very small groups of flying battalions, auxiliary battalions, that they killed tens of thousands Jews in Belarus, or in Poland, or Lithuania, people of Impulavichus, for instance, or Gatchas. So this is something that is very difficult to explain the speed, the velocity, and organization. The fact that not riffraff, but very educated people participated there, Catholic priests, for instance, some educators, people who pedagogically were probably lecturing and teaching against doing any harm to your fellow citizens. But at this time, it just happened that people were very well organized, their goals, their preparations, everything was there, and this logistically allowed this to happen very, very swiftly very rapidly. How would you explain that? What happened? Even some fascists of the Mussolini, of the, of the of Mussolini type in Lithuania, for instance, and Nasblinas were astonished and petrified. And they thought that although Jews were evil, they didn't deserve to be killed like that. So what happened, actually? I sometimes find myself thinking that sociologists or historians failed to explain in the Baltics what happened there. It seems to have been something like the destruction of social structure, of any sense of solidarity, and society was simply dead. There was no society at all left. So, so Professor Donskis asks a very difficult question, which is not only about the Holocaust in Lithuania, but really about the beginning of the Holocaust as such, because the, the Holocaust as such, that is the, 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 the rapid massive killing of Jews really begins in Lithuania in late June, early July, 1941. I, 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 I would take me, it would take me more time than we have to answer your question in a way which approaches adequate, but I want to just mention a couple of things. The first is that 
of course, as you know, I mean, the, the problem that you're facing is not just a Lithuanian one, because even if we are able to explain Lithuania adequately, as I'm going to try to do, you're still dealing with the issue of why Latvians did r roughly the same thing, and you're still dealing with the issue of why um, in different parts of, of, uh, of the Soviet Union people behaved in the same way, in a radically different social setting. Why were there collaborators in eastern Ukraine, um, as there were, and why essentially everywhere Nazi power extended in the Soviet Union was the kill rate roughly the same. The kill rate in, in, in Kiev and Kharkiv is about the same as Vilnius and Riga, even though those are very different experiences. And so the risk is that if I explain Lithuania in a way which is too particular, we will somehow be too optimistic because we will then be avoiding the, the hard reality that this kind of collaboration and this kind of success in killing was not just a Lithuanian phenomenon. That said, I, I think there's something special, and that something special is, as you said, the rapidity, but also the fact that it was the first. It was the way, it was the place where the, where the Germans found a certain kind of formula. And I want to make your question in a way even harder, because one of the easy ways to answer the question would be to say, well, Lithuanians were anti-Semitic and, and uh, anti-Semitism was a mass movement before the war. But this isn't true. I mean, this would help us for our explanation, but it's not, it's not true. If, if anything, Lithuanians and, and Lithuanian politics were less anti-Semitic than, say, Poland, for example. And there is a Holocaust in Poland, but there's nothing like what you're talking about. There's no mass, there's no quick mobilization, there's no massive collaboration. So you can't actually explain it in terms of local anti-Semitism, which is what most people want to do, because that would be very simple and, 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 and very reductive. So how do I explain it? Well, I think, first of all, you're onto something when you talk about the destruction of society. I don't think one can really begin to explain these things without understanding what it means to have an entire state um, destroyed by the Soviet Union. I mean, even, even Slovaks and Czechs and Poles don't really have any notion of what that would mean. Um, it's, it's, it's as particular Estonia and Latvia and Lithuanian experience to have, uh, to have a sovereign state and to have that state literally destroyed, to have the ruling classes killed and deported, um, and to have very rapid um, policies of, of, of collectivization implemented in, in, this, in, this, in this course of basically a year. It does matter, I think, that people were in prison or people were deported. Not because I want to count up the victims of, of Stalinism and measure them against the victims of Nazism. The victims of Nazism are much more numerous. But because deportation and imprisonment and murder all change society in a rather dr dramatic way. And I think one thing which is overlooked is property. Um, the, the Soviet rule means that the property question is thrown open in a dramatic way. Because Soviet rule means that there's no longer capitalism, there's no longer commerce, which means that Jews lose their social position, and it means that um, big Jewish properties, the factories, the stores, the businesses, the hotels, the banks, had already been nationalized, which means that when the Germans come in, the question is, who is going to get them? Right? And I think that is really significant. The fact that private property has been done away with already matters a great deal for how Lithuanians behave. So I really think you can't explain it without the prior Soviet experience. Now, the prior Soviet experience also creates a kind of very special political resource. When the Germans enter Poland, um, when the Germans invade eastern Poland in 1941, they can't say, we're going to restore Polish independence. That would be ludicrous, because they already invaded Poland in 1939. But they can say it in Lithuania, and they do. And, they're, and, and it's, it's, cr it's credible to, to certain people, at least for a while. And moreover, they can do something in Lithuania that's very special. They can bring with them, as you know, I'm just explaining this to everyone else, they can bring with them hundreds of activists who they have already chosen, who they've hand-selected. And those people can broadcast in the Lithuanian language, those people can set up local administration, and those people can be translators. Translators of what? Translators of a very important message. The, the, the Nazi ideology is, Juda is Judeo-Bolshevism. The Bolsheviks are Jews, the Jews are Bolsheviks. What the, what the Lithuanians uh, who come with the Nazis are able to translate that into is the idea that we are offering you liberation but only liberation from the Jews. And if you want to take part in your own liberation, therefore you're going to have to take part in killing Jews. Which is this very interesting sociological moment because um, in fact, you know, if we, if we look at the facts, 
the huge majority of collaboration, collaborators with the Soviet regime in Lithuania were Lithuanians, of course, not Jews. But it's precisely those Lithuanian collaborators or Lithuanians uh, who were drawn into the Soviet system in one reason or another who were the backbone of the German killing apparatus. So the Judeo-Bolshevik idea is a way of putting all the responsibility on the Jews. It's a way of cleansing yourself. And if you have been a communist, then it's a way of, it's a way of proving that, in fact, you're innocent. You know, so when the, when the Lithuanian activist front comes into Lithuania, those are the Lithuanian collaborators with the Nazis, and they put communists in prison, they then tell the communists, well, if you kill a Jew, you can cleanse yourself. So there's a translation effect here. The German idea that Jews are Bolsheviks and Bolsheviks are Jews is too abstract to be practical. But the Lithuanians who come with the Germans are able to translate it. But then they themselves are... Are, are victims in a way because, I mean, victims of a political miscalculation because they really think that if they take part in this project of killing Jews, they're going to get something like sovereignty out of it, which turns out to be false. By the time they realize it's false, though, it's the end of 1941 and most of Lithuanian Jews have, have, already, have, already, been, have already been murdered. Uh, so those are the th those are the special things about about Lithuania. I mean, there are generic things like when you mention Catholic priests. I mean, I wish one could say nicer things about interwar Catholic teaching about the Jews, but interwar Catholic teaching about the Jews, among other things, actually emphasized that that, that Jews were Bolsheviks and Bolsheviks were Jews. It's a, that's actually a very dark chapter in interwar Catholic teaching. Okay, I, I'm sure that's not a satisfactory answer, but it's it's the best I can do while giving some time to other people. Uh, good evening, my name is Ivan Guraj uh, from Faculty of Philosophy in Bratislava. You mentioned uh, two names, Arendt and Bauman. I first would like to say something about Arendt and uh, Bauman and then ask my question. Regarding uh, Arendt uh, and her book about the origins of totalitarianism, it poses uh, a fundamental question whether it is at all possible to understand uh, totalitarianism and she uh, perceived the Holocaust as a special case of totalitarianism. What I liked about uh, what you said was uh, that uh, uh, what Arendt uh, referred to as a big problem, you said that uh, we can imagine killing one person, but it's uh, beyond our imagination uh, to kill uh, uh, hundreds, thousands, and millions of people. So we lack a concrete idea as uh, how millions of people can be killed, what happened in the case of Holocaust. And regarding uh, Bauman, uh, my reading of Bauman was slightly different. It seems to me that Bauman in the book Modernism and Holocaust speaks about two things. He says that uh, Holocaust uh, comprises both forms, the modern and the archaic ones. He cites uh, several examples. He mentions, for example, Christianite that preceded the Holocaust, and he says that it was a primitive rampage uh, where uh, primitive methods of killing were used. But um, the way I understood Bauman was that he wanted to understand uh, or perceive Holocaust as a modern form of genocide. And it is against this background that he defines uh, the Holocaust as industrial and massive killing of people. And he concludes that in such a massive and industrial killing, it was no longer possible to use primitive methods, and it was necessary to resort to all technological means uh, uh, that existed in the 20th century in order to be able to uh, carry out the Holocaust at such a massive scale. Therefore, he spoke about uh, inter-influence, uh, inter-connection uh, between Holocaust and modernism. He does not say that modernism provoked Holocaust. He says that modernism, modernity, accompanied the Holocaust. It uh, helped the Holocaust. Therefore, there is no direct causal relationship that every modernity provoked uh, the Holocaust. Uh, it just made it possible to, to uh, it made possible the Holocaust thanks to the modern technological means. And he also 
and, and my question is whether you make a difference, whether you distinguish in your book uh, between um, the genocide and the Holocaust. Uh, be some of the crucial points. F first of all, I, I would hate for um, my, my book to be understood chiefly as an argument with anyone else. It's not chiefly an argument with Bauman. I don't think I even mentioned Bauman in the text. Um, it is to some extent an argument with Hannah Arendt, but I, I hope that it's a historical text which stands on its own rather than just being a kind of terminological dispute with, 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 with Bauman or with anyone else. Um, the reason why I, I spoke about it here was I was trying to stress what I take to be some of the differences between the approach, which, which let me just repeat, I, I think are, are nevertheless true, even accepting everything that you say. For example, the idea of plurality. I, I don't think Bauman's analysis can handle plurality. I, I think that whether you think modernity favors, as you say, or causes, um, it, it can't handle the plurality of, of modernity. It also can't handle the notion that modernity is something that you strive for, which is, for me, a kind of essential characteristic of the history of Eastern Europe in the middle of the 20th century, there's this striving for modernity. There's this moder modernization. There isn't really something like modernity. It, there's a kind of striving for it, and it's that striving um, which, which strikes me as being what was actually so dangerous in the time and, and in the place. On the question of, of scale, um, it doesn't really make any difference, I think, for your argument, whether you're talking about one person or ten people or a hundred people or a million people. No one killed a million people. No one killed a million people. The, the perpetrators who directly killed the most people killed about a thousand. No one shot that many people. Actually, the NKVD, the, the, this is an interesting difference between the Germans and the Soviets. The Soviets, because they really believed, I mean, the Soviets, I think, actually believed their ideas more than the Germans did. In the, for the NKVD, the officers had to do the shooting. The officers had to shoot. And because the officers had to shoot, they shot really large numbers of people. So, for example, in the Katyn massacre, there was one person, um, Blochen, who shot a couple thousand people all by himself. For the Germans, that was actually quite rare. It was rare for an individual to kill um, more than a few dozen or a few hundred people. There were a few individuals who shot a thousand people, but not very many. Um, so I don't, I don't think you know the question really r arises as to how someone could kill ten thousand or hundred thousand or a million because that never actually happened. Um, the people who were thinking on that scale, uh, Hitler never saw any of this happen. Himmler saw some of it happen. But the perpetrators were always killing on a small scale. And this is true even of the most, you know, to use your word, even in the most industrial facilities. The most industrial facility is Treblinka. The closest thing to an industrial facility is Treblinka. But even at Treblinka, each Jew was individually rounded up from the Warsaw Ghetto. Each Jew was individually put on a train. Each Jew was individually removed from that train. Each Jew, if she was a woman, had her hair individually shaved and individually went into the gas chamber. There's nothing collective about that. I mean, the numbers are very large, but, but, but individuals had to act upon other individuals for, for this to happen. So I don't really think that the scale changes, changes the analysis in and of itself. But let me talk about the word industrial. I, I used it because it's in your question, but I don't really believe that it reveals anything. There isn't really anything industrial about the Holocaust. Even by the scale of the industry of the 1930s and 1940s, there's nothing particularly impressive about the Holocaust as an operation. Um, moving a few million people around and then killing them was, was simpler than having, for example, um, high-level chemistry factories or uh, having weapons manufacture. It was much, much simpler than that. It was a very simple thing. And I think the reason why we like to think of it as a factory or as industry is because that somehow distances us and dehumanizes us, but let, but de and dehumanizes the people involved. Now, let me get though, though, to the essence of your question, you know, that, that Bauman says that it has to do with techniques and bureaucracy. Again, I don't actually think, so the, the problem with that book is that it came out in 1989, and the version of the Holocaust that he's using in his analysis is the version that we had in 1989. So he isn't really understanding the things that everybody now knows, namely that the Holocaust starts with 
chaotic and then ever more ordered shooting in Eastern Europe. That half of the Holocaust involves shooting and not gas chambers at all. Um, he doesn't really understand that because that's not what the Holocaust meant in 1989. It's what the Holocaust means now, but it's not what the Holocaust meant in 1989. I think it's very hard to uphold his portrait of the Holocaust as, as, as industrial when you realize that half of the Holocaust was just shooting and that the gas chambers were not created in order to be more orderly. They were just created to spare Germans the experience of shooting Jews. Um, that's the only reason they were there, and that's the only purpose that they served. And again, to stress this, as an organization, it really wasn't that complicated. Compared to fighting the Second World War, it wasn't complicated at all. It was relatively, it was relatively simple. Now, um, the, the, the counterexample that I would give you, and, 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 and Baumann, to his credit, you know, admits this, if you're looking for something that was planned in advance, um, which was organized, and which happened very quickly, that's Rwanda. In Rwanda, people were killed faster than in the Holocaust. And that's without, you know, that's without guns. <laughs> uh, so the idea that you need industrial society to kill people on a fast scale just turns out not to be true. The fastest mass killing in history is actually Rwanda in 1994. And there, you know, there was, there you just don't have, you don't have gas chambers, you don't really have weapons. Um, I mean, my own view is that Rwanda is probably more modern than we are willing to accept as, as Westerners. But I just, I give you that example because actually Rwanda looks more like Baumann's picture of the Holocaust than the Holocaust does. And it happened, it happened in Africa in a completely different sort of setting. So. Okay, there are more. Uh, so, here, please, but please be short. Okay. We have not much time and then... Uh, I would like to touch also the second book you mentioned, the interview with Tony Jad. I have heard many times opinion that in the future, uh, historians will think about one war in the 20th century. Just thinking the first and second world war will be just one war lasting something like more than 31 years. So more than 31 years with a break. What do you think about this in the, in the light of Holocaust? Could it be possible to, to consider both world wars as one military conflict of the 20th century in light of Holocaust? Um, I can only answer one thing at a time. Um, the, there, are very, there, there, there are several ways that you can bring the two together. Um, one of them is to, is to note that the, the, traditional, the traditional life of East European Jews was actually disrupted for the first time in the First World War and not the second. Um, we, we in the West, anyway, tend to forget about the Eastern Front of the First World War, but the Eastern Front of the First World War was just as bloody and just as important as the Western Front. And it involved lots of deportations. And among other things, it involved the deportation of at least half a million Jews in the Russian Empire, which was a major disruption. And it, and it, it radicalized people. It radicalized Jews, many of whom became communists as a result of it. Um, and, and helped in the Bolshevik Revolution. Many of them also became far right-wing uh, uh, politicians as well, and then later ended up in Israel in right-wing parties. The experience of deporting Jews was very was radicalizing for the Jews. It was also radicalizing for um, for for anti-Semitism, because uh, the idea that the Jews were to blame for what was going on worked in train with their deportation. If you deport people, then you have to say, well, we're deporting them because they're spies. It kind of works in a kind of cycle. And, so, and then as the, war, as the war went on and got worse for the Russian Empire, um, the, the Jews tended to be blamed for the failure. And then, of course, they were blamed for the Bolshevik Revolution, which leads to this idea of, of Judeo-Bolshevism. The Judeo-Bolshevik idea comes out of the Russian Civil War and then, is in, and then is imported into Germany by Baltic Germans and by Ukrainian and Russian emigres. So that's one, that's one connection. The experience of Jews in the Russian Empire during the First War in all of these ways of, makes the Holocaust somehow possible. It leads to ideology, and, and, and it's the first major disruption of, of, of East European Jewish life. And then there's obviously a second connection, which is that the First World War makes politicians like Hitler possible. It, it, as a result of the First World War, you have this moment afterwards where certain kinds of ideas, and I would say both Leninism and National Socialism, have a chance 
they wouldn't have had before the First World War. Um, the First World War ends a kind of globalization. It ends faith in liberalism. It makes all kinds of things thinkable that hadn't been thinkable before. So in, in those two ways, there's, there's certainly a connection between the two. That said, I, I stop short of this idea that it's all one big conflict, because it seems like when you say that it's, if you say it's one big conflict, then you're denying people in the 1920s and 1930s a certain amount of agency and responsibility. And I think the Second World War happened because of certain kinds of choices that were made. It's, it wasn't an inevitable consequence of the First World War. So there are these very close connections, to be sure. But I would, I, I myself, are not, am not comfortable treating it as one big conflict. So this is the last question. I'm, I'm sorry to say that. My, my name is Sonia Somolania. Som kolegyňa Somolaniova. I am a colleague of Mr. Burai from the School of Philosophy. I was very happy to hear from you this doubting, this questioning of this um, interpretation of nazism and communism as two totalitarian regimes, which are the product of modernization uh, linked with the name of Bauman, because I think that it's a very simplifying explanation of modernization reduced only to the industrialization dimension and this attitude dimension and organizational dimension are ignored completely in such an explanation or interpretation. And your examples and Rwanda is something which I really like and I subscribe to it. It's very important because when you read about modernization, you have this explanation that two totalitarian regimes and Holocaust are the product of modernization. And Bauman is quoted as a undoubted author, and I very often told my students that it's a very simplified approach to modernization and that I disagree because in Slovakia we experienced after 45 a type of modernization which at this level of attitudes and in the form of organization uh, strengthened the patterns of behavior and attitudes which are more typical for a feudal traditional society. So it was not a question. I only wanted to congratulate you for uh, da uh, casting yeah. doubts on or for challenging uh, uh, Bauman's paradigm. Uh, uh, actually, here because I, I feel like I feel like Professor Bauman could do a much better job of defending himself um, than th than I could. I mean, at this point, I feel like I should now change my position and start defending Professor Bauman, which I will. Um, one of the things which I think Professor Bauman has absolutely right it has to do with the relationship between um, modernity and responsibility. I think here, here his analysis and my analysis actually end up in, in much the same place. That um, it, although we start we start from different positions, that there's a there's a basic problem of responsibility in 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 in, in mass society, and it, it relates to the passage that was read from the book about victimhood, which I'd like which I'd like to return to because it seems like the the victim identity is something which is mass produced now. We all have access to various ways of being victims. Consuming, so to speak, the victim experience is probably the main way that the history that we're talking about is actually processed. Um, and I use the word processed in, in, in intentionally. So one place where Professor Baumann and I are very much in agreement is with, with it has to do with the problem of responsibility. Now, um, the, the, I want to close, though, in, 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 by mentioning a couple of things since you raised the, the issue of, of, of organization. One of the reasons why I have trouble um, with, with, with Arendt in particular, uh, it, it, well, I agree with her and disagree with her at the same time, has to do with precisely organization. Because the, 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 the Nazi regime was able to function, and actually this gets back to Leonidas Donskis' question a bit, partly because it was so good at disorganization. Um, the, the, the Germans, I mean, we, when we think about the Germans, we, we usually use an, an ethnic stereotype. They're very orderly, they liked institutions, you know, they measured everything, they recorded everything. If you look at the history of the Second World War, it's just not true. 
I mean, the, the, at least with respect to the subjects that we're talking about with mass murder, it's just not true. They experimented, they improvised, they didn't write things down, they were terribly imprecise, and their methods had everything to do with destroying institutions. You know, one thing that I, I should have said about this region, which I didn't say at the very beginning, is that another way of defining this region is that this is the place where pre-war states were totally removed. Um, and, and that's, I think, no coincidence. So the place where the Holocaust happened, the place where most of the killing of human beings happened, the place where the two regimes overlapped, is also the place where statehood was totally removed. Um, the Polish state was removed in fact and also in, in, in law. I mean, the Germans claimed that the Polish state had never existed. They claimed that what they were doing was not a military occupation because there had been no Polish state before that. And interestingly, the Soviets said much the same thing. They said that the Baltic states had never legally existed. Therefore, you could try Baltic citizens according to Soviet law for things that, they, for things that Baltic citizens did in the 1920s or, or, or 1930s. And this, I think, is, is no coincidence. I mean, it turns out that in order to kill by the Nazi method, you have to first disorganize. You have to first disorganize. And this is actually a difference with the Soviets. The Soviets were much more precise. Um, they broke down pre-existing society, but then they were much more precise about what they were doing. The, the, the Nazis, interestingly enough, exported a kind of anarchy. And then from that anarchy, they picked up pieces and put them together, and they learned how to kill which again is part of the answer to Professor Donskis' question. When the Nazis went into Lithuania, they did not know what they were going to do ahead of time. The Soviets had done some destruction, the Germans did more destruction, but they learned how to assemble certain pieces, certain emotions, certain fragments, certain experiences in such a way as to get to the, to get to the result that they were aiming for. But none of it was planned. There were general intentions but there weren't precise plans. And so one of the things which is really hard to grasp conceptually, you know, especially ideologically, is the way that the Germans actually exported anarchy, the way that they actually managed chaos. Um, that's something which was quite special to them. It makes them a little different from the Soviets. And it also means that they defy most of our attempts to, to conceptualize them. Because al almost all of our arguments about ideology or about modernity are ways of making the Nazis make sense. They're ways of making, they're ma ways of making something which fundamentally was anti-enlightenment. I mean, this is another part of, I mean, now I'm disagreeing with, with Professor Bauman again. But this is another, the, the Nazis were fundamentally anti-enlightenment. And we keep trying to bring them into some kind of enlightened analysis. Whereas, in fact, they were against the Enlightenment. And they showed what you can do when you destroy the institutions of the Enlightenment. When you destroy statehood, when you destroy civil codes. They, destroyed what, they showed what you could then do. And that's part of the Holocaust, um, which, 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 which you can't really understand, I think, unless you accept that the, if, if you're going to call this modernization, um, it has to be a modernization which involves destroying other people's modernizations. <laughs> Uh, okay, I, uh, uh, vám ešte veľmi krátky... I will read a very small part of the book with uh, Judd and its a comment on history. I say it because it is not only a book which should be mandatory reading for all of us, but it's also written in an excellent way. And Timothy Snyder že nemáme jen proto, aby si lidé kupovali naše knihy. A nejen proto, že to patří k úkolu historika, ale i proto, že už zbývá jen málo řemesel, které se chovají zodpovědně k jazyku. U zodpovědného vyjadřovacího řemesla, které ještě zbývá, se nacházíme přímo v centru. To si myslím, že je velká pravda o a Timothy je přesně ten typ historika, který má fantastický jazyk a je to vlastně velká literatura. A na záver, základní etická odpovědnost historie spočívá v tom, aby lidem připomínala, že se skutečně odehrály mnohé události. Skutky a útrapy byly opravdivé. Lidé nějak žili a jejich životy skončily právě tímto a ne jiným způsobem. A ať už je řeč o lidech v Alabamě v 50. letech, anebo v Polsku v letech 40. Základní etická platnost těchto prožitků je stejně reálná jako u naší vlastní zkušenosti. A nebo je pro nás při nejmenším srozumitelná a v tomto smyslu nepominutelně reálná. Myslím, že Timothy Schneider prostě urobil přesně tento úžasný. So he made, Timothy made this fantastic piece of art. Uh, 
bloody lands is exactly I think Timothy today represents uh, top quality among historians and I thank him for coming among us I thank you for coming